there are a lot of differences between animal protein and plant-based proteins, and one is the amino acid structure of the food, of the, of the, um, of the food itself. And so uh, animal-based proteins contain a lot of sulfur-containing amino acids. And I'll, I'll give you just one example of how that can increase the risk of a specific type of cancer. So take colon cancer, which is one of the leading causes of cancer death in Western countries. Um, the mucosal lining of, of the colon um, is very smooth and uh, irritation causes polyps. In fact, irritation any place where you have a mucosal membrane, like even the sinuses, can cause polyps. Well, irritation causes polyps in the mucosal lining, and the more the irritation, uh, the bigger the polyps get, and at a certain point in time they can become cancerous. Well, where does this irritation come from? Well, it comes from sulfur-containing amino acids, which uh, one of the toxic byproducts um, irritates the lining of the colon. So um, that's quite different than the amino acid chains that make up plant proteins, which have some of these same uh, amino acids, but in much smaller quantity. So there's a big difference between plant protein and animal protein, but as I said earlier, consuming too much of any of it is a bad idea. Well, I have a good friend who speaks at these conferences too, called Molesistan, and he makes a, a comment. I'll try and make it as, as close to his version as possible, but he says all the time, um, cardiovascular disease need never exist, and if it exists, it need never progress. In other words, there are places on the planet where you still see populations that have virtually no cardiovascular disease. And what they have in common is they eat a low-fat, plant-based diet. Animal food's a condiment. They eat it, but it's in very tiny quantities. Here, it's the center of the plate. So the bottom line is that it's a, it's a diet and lifestyle-induced disease. We could get rid of it if we, if we chose to. And doing so would be a good idea, first of all, because it kills 44% of the population. People would live their full lifespan in many cases. And the second thing is it costs so much money. I mean, we spend probably 20% um, of the healthcare budget in this country is spent on a disease that absolutely doesn't even need to exist. You know, genetics play a role in everything. You know, it's why I have, well, we don't know what color my hair is. We <laughs> At my age, you don't want to know. But it's why I have brown eyes and somebody else has blue eyes and somebody's blonde or you know, the genetics plays a role. And, and some genes you can't do much about. The brown eyes genes, not, not so much negotiation that you can have there. Um, genes do predispose people to disease, but this is a much more negotiable contract than the genes that dictate brown eyes and being five feet seven inches tall. And so um, two things to say about genes. The first thing is that you can switch on a genetic predisposition by misbehaving. So autoimmune diseases, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, run in my family. All women on my mother's side of the family had rheumatoid arthritis by the time they were in their 50s. I don't. Well, the reason is that I don't engage in the types of behaviors that cause that disease to onset and progress. I, I could make myself have, I'm sure if I started behaving badly, I could get, develop rheumatoid arthritis in a fairly short period of time, but I don't. So the, you have a choice. It's a predisposition. It's not a sentence. And that is a very important distinction for people because none of us get to choose our genes. So if we really believe that genetic predisposition is going to determine our health outcomes, Gosh, we're all helpless victims, but if you believe that and you understand that it's really up to you, uh, then you have a lot more power over your health outcomes. The other side of it is that I've seen fam people and families, no genetic predisposition at all for a disease, but there's so much misbehavior that they can actually override their good genetic profile and end up overweight and sick. So it works both ways. You can have a strong genetic predisposition and overcome it, uh, by behaving badly, eating terrible foods, not exercising, gaining weight, and end up with the family disease. Um, or you can, you can do the same thing. You can override your good genetic predisposition by behaving badly. I should probably say that differently. I'm going to say that again. So this works both ways. A person with a, with a genetic predisposition can override that by doing the right things. And a person who has a great genetic predisposition can override that by misbehaving. So really it's up to you what to do about that.
Well, the main contributors to stroke, it's, it's the same thing as cardiovascular disease. People eat a lot of cholesterol and fat. Um, their blood becomes viscous and sticky. They develop plaques inside the arteries. The arteries start to constrict. Um, the stroke is a blood clot and the vessels that go to the brain are in, in the interior of the brain. Again, completely preventable. And, and stroke, I mean, both stroke and heart attack can result in instant death. Um, but many people recover much more nicely from a heart attack than they do from a stroke. Stroke can cause permanent disability. And, and one thing I want to say about this, and I think it's important, when you have a stroke or when something fairly cataclysmic happens to you from a health perspective that impairs your ability to function, this isn't just about you. It's about the burden that gets thrust upon your family and your friends, and um, that happened to me. You know, my mother spent the last 15 years of her life being sick because she wouldn't take care of herself, and um, it not only impacted her, her quality of life was terrible. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I watched my father become increasingly exhausted from the, the just the emotional ordeal and the logistics of her in and out of hospitals and operations and rehab in a nursing home. and and my sister, who was far more involved in it than I was. Um, and, and so everybody suffers. So I always tell people, you know, one of the most unselfish things that you can do is to be selfish enough to take good care of yourself, take the time to take good care of yourself so that you don't end up becoming a burden on the people who you love. Yeah, diet and lifestyle and some environmental factors. And, and I would say cigarette smoking is an environmental factor. Um, for, that's a big one, for example. But, but it's primarily diet and lifestyle. There, is, there are some instances where um, cancer develops and, and we really don't have an explanation and, and time, people who really have been dealt a poor genetic hand. But the vast major majority of the time, it's, it's diet and lifestyle. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. We have very specific mechanisms of action in, in all of these things. Um, one is that people consume dairy products. Well, dairy products come from uh, pregnant and lactating cows or other animals, sheep, goats, whatever. Um, well, these products contain estrogen as a result. So most breast cancers, for example, are estrogen receptor positive. So consuming estrogen and estrogen metabolites in food is definitely counterproductive if you don't want to get breast cancer, all right? Um, it has a different type of effect on men, but the risk that a man who eats dairy products will develop prostate cancer is higher than the risk that a smoker will develop lung cancer. This is pretty strong stuff, you know? Another thing is that people overeat and they gain weight. They become overweight or obese. Um, fat cells produce inflammatory cytokines, which raises the general inflammation level in the body. And inflammation is a factor in every disease that people don't want to get, including cancer. And so uh, this, increase, this type of behavior increases the risk of cancer. But then once you have cancer, it decreases the uh, chance that you will survive or not have a recurrence. And what's so distressing to me is, first of all, watching people, the way they eat, the way they take care of themselves, they don't exercise, et cetera, they don't drink enough water. So you watch people engage in what is essentially self-destructive behavior, whether they realize it or not, and end up getting cancer, and that's tragic but then they often get treatment for cancer and go back to doing those very same things, which is almost a guarantee that at some point in time either a recurrence of cancer is going to happen or some other dreadful thing. You know, those, the same habits that lead to cancer also lead to heart disease and autoimmune diseases and arthritis and many, many other conditions that people don't want to get.